One of the most time-consuming things about business is matching client requirements with whatever it is that you're selling. So today we're going to see if we can bridge that gap with AI. If you haven't done so already, do subscribe to the channel now so you don't miss any future uploads. My name is Alex, let's take a look at this. Alright, so what are we working with today? We basically have an Airtable database of client requests, client searches for properties, for real estate properties, and a list of properties, right? Now, the idea behind the setup that I've made is the fact that you can swap properties out for anything else, for cars, for any kind of object, really. And any kind of request should also work. But in this case, we're working with real estate because I guess it's a little bit easier to understand. So the way that this works, let me just clear this out. We have a contact called John and he has submitted one search for a property that is an apartment with a minimum price of 500 and maximum price of 3000. All I have to do is just click on find matches, wait a few seconds until the system starts up, then it's gonna think about it and then it's gonna suggest some properties. Now, in this case, we have property number one and property number two. Both are apartments and within the price range, right? Now, let's say I change this apartment type to a condo and let's rerun the search again. Starting up and we're waiting only for property number, for only one property, right? Property number two. There you go. That's it. So, as you can see, it's a fairly effective system. Okay given that we've only given it a couple of parameters, but it will handle way, way, way more. Now, without any further ado, in our typical style, let's take a look at how the database is set up, although there's not much to talk about. And we're gonna go over very briefly over how the automation is basically pieced together. Again, just like I did in my last video, there is a link down in the description below where you can purchase the automation template so that you can recreate this with all the necessary details that are involved. The reason why I'm doing this is because the prompt engineering behind this took hours, the whole setup, the testing, it does take a long time to make sure that everything's working um, as expected consistently. Let's take a look at the setup of the database. All right, so let's get started. Essentially, what we have here is our list of contacts. We have Mike, who is basically selling a bunch of properties, right? Property one, two, three, and four. We also have John, who has added a search. But essentially, these are just links back to properties, if you're Mike, and back to searches, because John has submitted a search. Let's go to the next table we have properties. Now, these are roughly, I mean, with the exception of the record ID, these are roughly the fields that I care about on a day-to-day -day basis, but there are some hidden fields as well. So essentially we have the seller, right? Who sells this property? In fact, maybe I should just add Mike to property number five. Then what we have is generate web summary status. And this is from a different video where um, you can see it in somewhere in the top right hand corner or something like that, where I'm generating a quick web summary of this particular property. And it kind of looks like this. Check out that video. You'll see what I, what I mean. But for the purposes of what we're doing right now, it's kind of relevant. And the final record ID field basically just fetches the record ID from each record. Again, you're not going to need this when you're going to be using this. Next, searches. So the search essentially consists of a quick little formula here in the left-hand corner where I'm just saying, you know, concatenate search, space hashtag, the search number, uh, space pipe space, and then the contact. So that basically we can see, because every contact can have multiple searches. Maybe John is looking for apartments in this price range, but he's also looking for condos in a different price range. So that can be done, absolutely. Then we have the applied attributes of that search. 
essentially, and this kind of leads us to talk about these two tables, applied attributes and attributes list. So we have for absolutely anything in the world, including real estate, we have some kind of attributes, right? So in real estate, you might have, you know, the property type or the property price for cars. You would have something like uh, the horsepower, the price, the amount of seats. I don't know that sort of thing. What we have with applied attributes, that's where we marry the thing. Let's say the property with a particular parameter with a particular attribute. And we also give it the value of that attribute. So the thing could be the property or it could be the search itself. It doesn't really matter. What I'm doing here is I'm basically marrying them. Property, property price is so much for this particular property. If John is looking for his search number one for the parameter called price range, then he has to give me the minimum maximum price range. And I can see that he's also added, or rather maybe we've added the uh, property type to be an apartment. In this case, I've also said that the properties here, number one, number two, number three, also have different property types. One's a condo, one's an apartment, one's a commercial property. Back to my searches, I'm basically applying these attributes to that particular search. Hopefully that's understood. Then I have a field called strict requirements. Essentially, this sometimes, very rarely, the AI kind of oversteps its bounds. And maybe let's say my uh, maximum price is 3000, but it might suggest a property that's 3500. So in order to enforce a more strict approach, you can always tick this button so that it understands that it has to really, really follow the rules. Then we have a search status field, just a simple te long text field, nothing fancy. The matched properties, which links back to the properties and also our trigger for find matches. We've already discussed applied attributes a little bit. There's also a few uh, hidden fields, the record type, which essentially looks like this, where I'm saying, you know, if the search is blank, then say it's property attributes. Otherwise, search attributes so that you can kind of group them by the record type. Just going to hide this. What else? I think one important field here is the name. So the name is what we're using within the AI prompt. This is very important to basically set it up like so, so that the name always describes the attribute really, really well. Like property price, price is 1000. Property type, type is apartment. Price range, minimum price, maximum price. It's important basically for this name field to represent well the attribute. And we also have some final uh, hidden fields. What do we have? Okay, so we have fetch from parameter, which essentially fetches the type from the parameter there's a fetch text, which basically concatenates that into a simple string. And that's basically it. We're using these two fields to make this leftmost name field perform better. I think that's it. I mean, the rest of the fields are pretty self-explanatory. Properties links to properties, search links to searches, parameter links to parameters, mint value, max value, these are just for uh, price ranges. The evaluation value, that is for the property price, basically, you know, the evaluation of the house. And the type is basically the property type. And I've got some choices over here. Let's jump into the attribute list. Again, the attribute list, super straightforward. We have the attribute name, where it's applied in the applied attributes. And also we decide what we want to fetch in this case, minimum price, maximum price. Like what do you want to, when this attribute is applied here, what field do you want to fetch inside of this name? Do you want to fetch the valuation value, the type value and so forth? And that's basically it. Web summary requirements is something completely different from the previous video, nothing to do with what we're doing now. So yeah. That's it in terms of the database design. Let's now take a very quick sneak peek at what is happening with the automation.
All right, so the automation is set up in three parts. Part one, from Airtable into Make into Respell. Then part two, the whole Respell setup that basically does stuff with the data that was sent it from part one. And then part three, it's essentially the part that listens to all the responses from Respell and posts them into Airtable. Now, there's a link down below, shameless plug, if you do want my full explanation, tutorial, call it whatever you want for how to set up the automation, you can purchase it down below. Let's take a very quick look at how I've done this. I'm not gonna divulge way too much uh, information, but you should get a sense of how this whole thing. So first and foremost, we begin with the automation that actually sends data to Respell. And as you can see, I'm just going into my automations. There is an automation that I've called AI Matchmaker Get Matches for Searches. And it triggers when the Find Matches field is checked within our searches table. That runs our script that we know and love on this channel that basically looks like this. We have our webhook that we get from make.com. We map our variable record underscore ID and the value, of course, the Airtable record ID from the search. Once that's done, basically turn this on, and then the search lands in this first part where we are preparing the data for respell. Now, here, what happens is that we essentially fetch the data, we update the record once to say that we're starting the procedure of matching, then the next part, this part over here, deals with actually collecting the data of the search itself. As you can see, search ID is so-and-so. The search parameters are price range and then property type, type apartment, all comma separated. Then we have another part, this part, that deals with the attributes of the properties that we have in our system. Again, one thing that I want to kind of highlight here is that everything is in a very rough stringed fashion. I'm not really trying to turn this into JSON. I'm not really trying to be clever about this, mainly because I've done a lot of testing and it seems like AI works best to a degree with simple strings. So turning this into JSON didn't have exactly the results that I expected it to have, just as a side note. And then finally, we have our API key that I'm storing here, and we have our very straightforward call to Respell, where I am basically matching everything as per Respell's API requirements. Then we have the Respell scenario itself, which does a whole bunch of different things. And finally, we have the last part that listens to Respell's responses and posts those responses back into Airtable. The responses are separated into two different types. There is a response that says starting. This particular part should say that the process is thinking like so. Um, I'm not sure why it's not posting it right now, but for any reason, we basically update the record to notify the user that, hey, something's happening. We've started going through the respell process. Once that's done, of course, we fetch the data in this case where, you know, the type is result when the response that we get from respell, the type is result. Then we proceed with just mapping the match properties back from respell back into Airtable. And that's basically it. So that's it guys, thank you very much for watching. I really hope that you found this video helpful. Let me know down in the comments below if you're gonna use this, if you have any suggestions as to how to make this even better. And yeah, I'll see you in the next one. Cheers, thanks.